Hello again, this is Bob Weir with the Cross Timbers Gazette, and uh, my guest today is Republican Congressman Michael Burgess, who represents us in the 26th Congressional District of Texas. Dr. Burgess is a physician who practiced medicine in North Texas for more than 25 years before being elected in 2002 to the U.S. House of Representatives. Dr. Burgess serves on several prestigious committees, including the House Energy and Commerce <coughs> Committee. He is currently running for re-election to his eighth term in the Republican primary on March 1st, easy for me to say. He has two opponents, Micah Beebe and Joel Strauss, both of whom have been interviewed recently. Thank you for being here, Congressman. Bob, it's my great pleasure to be with you. We've done this a time or two in the past. Uh, yes, we have. Looking forward to uh, a good exchange today. All right, let's start with last week the House failed to override President Obama's veto of a bill that would have repealed key provisions of Obamacare and stripped federal funding from Planned Parenthood. Can you tell us how you voted on that bill and why? Well, I voted to, uh, to override the veto, and of course that uh, had the veto been overridden, it would have stripped funding for Planned Parenthood, not just uh, discretionary funding, but so-called mandatory funding as well. All the money that comes to Planned Parenthood through Medicaid for other programs would have been put on pause for a year's time because of the, as a result of some of the dreadful videos that people have seen in the past several months. And, uh, you know, when Donald Trump said, we're going we're gonna to stop people coming into this country until we figure out what the hell is going on, this is the same principle applied to Planned Parenthood. Until we figure out what is going on with those videos and the sale of uh, literally pieces of, of babies, uh, we don't think that any taxpayer money should be going to Planned Parenthood. Now, uh, discretionary money, one thing. Uh, mandatory money is another thing. It's a little bit harder to get mandatory money out of the system, but that's what the bill that the president vetoed, that's what it would have done. And, you know, interestingly, that came through a process known as reconciliation. You will remember in the 2014 election, people were saying, gosh, we need a Republican Senate, we need a Republican Senate. One of the things you can do with the Republican Senate is to pass a budget. The House and the Senate each pass a budget, then they pass a unified budget resolution. That budget resolution contains what are called reconciliation instructions, and those reconciliation instructions allow things to be uh, voted on by the House and the Senate with simple majorities. So the Senate can overcome the filibuster using reconciliation instructions in a budget resolution. All a little complicated, I, I get that, but that was the deal. You can, with, it will be hard to get a bill defunding Planned Parenthood through the current Senate because it takes 60 yes votes to proceed. But on a budget vote, on a budget reconciliation vote, it only takes 51 votes. So here was an opportunity. And this was a big deal. This is probably only the third time that the, that the House has heard a veto override of the President's. Not many things get vetoed and sent back to the House because the Senate blocks everything. And certainly under Harry Reid that was true, but even for the past year it has been frustrating getting anything through the Senate. So here's something in which I believe very strongly. It did get voted out of the Senate, voted out of the House, went to the President, he vetoed it, and the House did not have the votes to override the presidential veto. But make no mistake about it, you change the occup occupant of the White House, this would be law. This would be law. And that's the important point, I think, for people to understand here. We often hear from Republican candidates for president that if elected, they will overturn Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, is that still possible? Yes, is the short answer. It gets a little harder uh, with every week, month, year that goes by, but it is possible. Um, certainly, the individual whom I'm supporting for president has said, uh, Ted Cruz has said, very forcefully, many times, he'll come here to Flower Mound, Texas and say, I'm going to repeal every syllable of Obamacare. And I'll stand on my chair and cheer along with everyone else. But I also recognize until you get someone sworn into uh, the presidency who carries that as a mission, it's going to be very, very difficult to get that done, which is why I, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm supporting Senator Cruz in his, his quest for the White House. But there are things you can do, and it will take a new president, and this is the, the tough part. Um, with a new president, and this is what I tell people, the minute he or she takes their hand off the Bible on Inauguration Day, before you go to the celebratory lunch with the Senate, 
the president can issue an executive order and repeal the individual mandate. And suddenly the most coercive aspect of this terrible law is immediately undone. So that is what the power of the presidency would bring regardless of who it was if it's a conservative. Um, it would bring that power to begin to, to wind the system back to something that makes some sense. Well, you know, Republicans have been criticized by Democrats for failing to come up with an alternative to Obamacare. Do the Republicans have a replacement plan? Well, of course, you and I have talked about this uh, several times. <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago, I wrote this great book yes, uh, called Doctor in the House. A great the first book, ten right. chapters are all whining about uh, the process. The last two chapters are the forward-looking part on what it would have been more reasonable than what the president and congressional Democrats passed back in 2010. The, the alternative to Obamacare, I already outlined, you need to get rid of the individual mandate. Right now you have a situation where insurance companies are enriching themselves. Insurance is more expensive than, than it's ever been before. And, and people are aware of this, and insurance companies are in fact doing very, very well if you check their annual reports with the stockholders. Um, but the bottom line is the people are not well served by this. So what would I do? And I've already actually introduced legislation that would expand health savings accounts, expand them significantly. Uh, look, when Obamacare passed and the House and the Senate actually gave themselves a special deal. so we actually get a special subsidy to buy Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Now, no one else gets that. And so here's, here are dollars that are untaxed. Is that even legal? I don't know. And it's walked into the exchange on behalf of a senator or congressman. I did not take that deal, Bob. Mm -hmm. When that was proffered, I said, no, thank you. Number one, I did not want to be in the Washington, D.C. health exchange to start with. I, my doctors are in Texas. But more importantly, no one else, no one else that I represent, people who buy their insurance in the individual market like I do, no one else could get that kind of deal. So I bought on healthcare.gov an individual policy in the individual market, most miserable process I've ever been through in my life. It took me three months and a week to get through it for my check to clear back in 2013, 2014. The insurance policy that I bought was the most expensive one I've ever had. I had to pay for it all with after-tax dollars, and it had a deductible the likes of which I had never seen before. Look, I've had a health savings account for a long time. I believe in health savings accounts. I believe in a high deductible health plan, putting some money away in a tax-deferred account to help defray those expenses. I get that. I've never seen a deductible as high as I had with going through a Blue Cross PPO bought in the healthcare.gov exchange. So things we could do today, we could expand health savings accounts. Why don't we make, for anyone who's buying insurance in the individual market in, at either the bronze or silver level in the, in, the, in the insurance exchange, in the health exchange, make those policies by definition HSA compatible. That is, you don't have to do anything else. They are by definition HSA compatible. Then let's make the amount of money you can put into your HSA each year identical to the amount that's in the deductible for the bronze or silver plan. Right now, I'm capped at $3,400 a year that I can put into my health savings account. My deductible is $6,000. Why not make those two look more like each other and allow that dollar figure to be put into that health savings account each year? We're not talking about a lot of money that would then be untaxed, and certainly that is something that is eminently affordable. A bigger deal would be to say, for you all who are buying your insurance in the individual market, you can buy that with pre-tax dollars. You can, you, that is now a tax deductible event, and let's reduce the cost of, of purchasing that insurance. And then the last thing I would do is make the purchase of those catastrophic policies something you could do on a national market so you could buy it across state lines. How about this? Uh, in terms of importance, what are the three major issues facing the country in 2016? Well, believe it or not, one of the things that uh, really comes to the top of the list, and I don't do a lot of polling, but when I do polling, the thing that comes to the top of the list is the lack of leadership in this country. People in this area feel it, it is painful to them, and they are anxious to see that situation resolved. I would be misleading you if I didn't say that immigration reform or more properly border security wasn't still a properly a, a number one issue in the area. For me, health care always ranks near the top, but the other thing that always gets people's attention is the level of federal spending. 
Uh, just one other quick question I have to ask before we wrap up. Uh, our country has somewhere around a $20 trillion <coughs> debt. Is it possible to ever pay that off? Well, the short answer is yes. The, the long answer is the number may go up to infinity as the number of years. But here's, here's the deal. You don't uh, the economy is going to grow, and part of that growth is going to displace some of that debt. But you also need to stop accumulating it at the rate it, at which it is accumulating. Now, Congress controls, out of the 12 spending bills that we pass each year, last year we couldn't pass any, so we put them all together in one big bill at the end of the year, but those 12 spending bills are what, the, those are the dollars that Congress spends each year. Discretionary spending, so-called discretionary spending, is at its lowest percent as a percentage of GDP since the Korean War. So since 2010, when Republicans were elected to the House, we have functioned as a restraining order. Now, anyone I talk to down here said, well, it hadn't been enough. You need to cut it even more. I don't disagree with that. But do remember you have 435 other members of the House who will, who will weigh in on that. But the other thing, too, is the unfunded liability, the liability that actually goes up beyond what is just on the books as a national debt. And that's in the, what, 50, 60, 70 trillion dollar range, depending yeah. upon whom you read. Here's a little reported fact from last year. In, in calendar year 2015, a bill that, that, I, that I introduced, HR2, was uh, dealt with Medicare reform. And it actually unwound about three trillion dollars of unfunded liability when you look at the Medicare trust fund report for calendar year 14 and 15, it actually is down almost $3 trillion because of changes we made to the Medicare system uh, that passed last April. Wow. Well, Congressman, it's, uh, it's always a Didn't pleasure. Didn't you want to ask me about how a bill becomes law? <laughs> yes. Well, the quick answer to that, I refer people to Schoolhouse Rock, uh, just a bill on Capitol Hill. Now, unfortunately, you have a president who does executive orders and pushes the rest of us down the steps, but it is, uh, which